This fear response problem is a good problem to look at because it combines several different ideas. It involves something that's rolling without slipping, so there's some rotational motion, but it also involves conservation of energy as well as projectile motion. And so we have a thin hoop with a mass m and radius r that give us that the rotational inertia of the hoop is m r squared, although that is sometimes one that they expect that you know. They would expect that you would know that all of the mass is at the edge of it. All of it is a distance r from the axis of rotation. And so the rotational inertia would be the sum of all the little masses times r squared, and it'll add up to equal m r squared. But it's released from rest at the top of a ramp. The ramp makes an angle theta, and it, the hoop rolls without slipping down the ramp. And so if something is rolling without slipping, there's a couple of things that this means. The first is that we can look at this as a combination of pure rotation around its center of mass, as well as translational motion of the object looking at the velocity of the center of mass. And because it rolls without slipping, that means that the point of contact between the hoop and the ramp is stationary. Slipping means that there's motion between those two surfaces. Not slipping means that that point of contact, the velocity, is zero. And so if that point of contact is going to have a velocity of zero, if we're looking at a combination of rotation around the center of mass, as well as linear motion, this gives us a relationship between the velocity of the center of mass and the angular velocity. If it's rolling without slipping, and we look at this as a combination of pure translational motion, where we have the velocity of the center of mass, and pure rotation with an angular velocity omega around its center of mass, we can see that if that point of contact is going to have zero velocity, that means that this tangential velocity for the pure rotation, it must be exactly opposite the velocity of the hoop when we're looking at the translational piece. And so for rotation, v equals r omega, and this velocity must equal the velocity of the center of mass. So that gives us that relationship that the velocity of the center of mass equals r omega for something rolling without slipping. The other equation that we have that comes directly from this one is that the acceleration of the center of mass of the object will end up equaling r times the angular acceleration. And so we'll be using both of those pieces in this problem. So the first thing that we're asked is to derive an expression for the acceleration of the center of mass of the hoop as it rolls down the ramp. And so what I've drawn here is I've drawn the force diagram for this, and I've shown the forces acting at the point of application. So the force of gravity acts right at the center of mass of the hoop. And the normal force and the force of static friction act right at that point of contact between the hoop and the ramp. And so we have two things going on. We're going to apply Newton's second law for the linear motion. Newton's second law says that the net force equals the mass times the acceleration. So if we look at the forces acting on this, the net force is going to equal the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass of this hoop. But then we also have torques acting, causing it to rotate. And if we look, of the three forces, only one of them is exerting a torque. The force of gravity acts along a line right through the center of mass. The normal force acts along a line right through the center of mass. And so there's no torque about the center of mass. Again, we're treating this as pure rotation around its center of mass. So the center of mass is our axis of rotation. So the only force that's applying a torque about the center of mass is going to be that force of static friction. And so looking at the forces, we have that the normal force is going to cancel out the perpendicular component of the weight. And so we have the parallel component of the weight acting down the ramp, and we have the force of static friction acting up the ramp. Those two forces are going to cause the linear acceleration. An important note, in this problem, it did not ask us for a force diagram. If it would have asked for a force diagram, one of the things you have to make sure is that you would have drawn what I had previously with just those three forces because one of the things that they ask in the force diagram is that you make a drawing of the, all of the forces that are acting and not the components. And so you would not want to add in the parallel and perpendicular components of the weight 
you would want to sketch it in a separate drawing just like I'm doing here. And so now I'm going to apply Newton's second law to this object. The net force acting on that object is going to equal the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass of that object. And I'm going to make down the ramp positive, so my net force is going to be the parallel component of the weight down the ramp minus the force of static friction acting up the ramp. So my net force is mg sine theta minus the force of static friction acting up the ramp, and those two together equal the mass times the acceleration. Again, I made sure that I'm using capital M because we were given that the mass was capital M. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing looking at the torque. We have that the net torque equals the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. The torque due to a force equals the perpendicular component of the force times r. Can we look at the distance r from the point of application of the force to the axis of rotation? And one of the easiest ways, especially for this situation, is to look at the component of the force that's perpendicular to that r vector. Here, the torque that I'm looking at is due to the force of static friction, which we can see is perpendicular to this radius. So the torque due to the force of static friction is going to be that force times r. The rotational inertia of the hoop that we're given is capital M r squared. And we have that multiplied times the angular acceleration. So net torque equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration. So the final piece that we need to put together for this is that relationship that I had said previously. If it's rolling without slipping, there's a relationship between the acceleration of the center of mass and this angular acceleration. We have that the acceleration of the center of mass equals r times the angular acceleration. And so we can use that to substitute in, and we could write both of these equations in terms of the angular acceleration alpha, if that's what we were looking for, or we could write both of these equations in terms of the acceleration of the center of mass, which that's what we are looking for in this problem. So I'm going to substitute in that the angular acceleration equals a over r. So now I'm able to simplify this a little bit. I can divide both sides by r, that's going to get rid of one of those r's. And then I still have an r in the numerator and the r in the denominator, so those are going to divide out. And from my torque equation, I'm left with the force of static friction equals m times the acceleration. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that and I'm going to substitute it into my other equation. So I have that mg sine theta minus the force of friction, which is ma, equals M A. And so if I add M A to both sides, I get M G sine theta equals 2 M times the acceleration of the center of mass. Or solving for that acceleration, I divide both sides by 2 M, and I get G sine theta over 2. And that is the expression for the linear acceleration of the center of mass of this hoop. So the next piece is to derive an expression for the speed of the center of mass of the hoop when it reaches the bottom of the ramp. And so I'm going to go back to the diagram and we're going to look at conservation of energy. This hoop is starting at a height h that's L sine theta. And as it rolls down the ramp, it's going to be picking up kinetic energy. It's going to be losing potential energy and gaining kinetic energy. But because it's rolling without slipping, we have two types of kinetic energy. We have linear kinetic energy due to the motion of its center of mass, and we have rotational kinetic energy due to its angular velocity. The linear kinetic energy is one half the mass times the velocity of the center of mass squared. The rotational kinetic energy is one half times the rotational inertia times the angular velocity squared. And so for this part, I'm going to be calling the height zero at the bottom of the ramp. And so at the beginning, I only have potential energy because it's being released from rest. And at the bottom of the ramp, I'm only going to have kinetic energy. So I'm going to go down and I'm going to apply the idea of conservation of energy. The idea of conservation of energy says, if I only have conservative forces doing work on the object, then the total mechanical energy stays constant. And so some people at first might say, well, wait, there's friction. We just talked about the force of static friction in that last part. That force of static friction, because that point of contact is stationary, the force of static friction does zero work. 
And so the only thing that's doing work is the force of gravity as this rolls down the ramp. And so we're able to still apply conservation of energy. And so conservation of energy says that if I know the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at one point in the motion, it must equal the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at any other point in the motion. And so I'm going to look at the beginning where it only has potential energy, it has gravitational potential energy, so that's mgh, but the height h is L sine theta. There's zero kinetic energy. At the end, there's zero potential energy. And then my kinetic energy is what I was talking about before. It is both the rotational kinetic energy and the kinetic energy due to the center of mass velocity. So there's a couple of substitutions that we're going to make. First of all, we know that the rotational inertia I is mr squared. But then we also said that there was a relationship between the velocity of the center of mass and the angular velocity omega. And so we can use that to write both of those terms in terms of the velocity of the center of mass or to write both of those terms in terms of the angular velocity omega. Here, because we want the speed of the center of mass, we want vcm we want to write omega in terms of that velocity. So since that velocity of the center of mass equals r times omega, that means that omega equals the velocity divided by r. And because omega is squared, we're going to have that quantity squared. And so plugging those values in and simplifying this a little bit, we have the potential energy, mg L sine theta, equals the translational kinetic energy, one half m times the velocity of the center of mass squared, plus the rotational kinetic energy, one half the rotational inertia, m r squared, times omega squared. So that's v over r quantity squared. But squaring a fraction means you square the numerator and square the denominator. And so I can see that there's a quick simplification. This radius doesn't matter. And so I have two terms that they're both one half m times the velocity of the center of mass squared plus one half m times the velocity of the center of mass squared. So I can combine those two like terms. So one half mv squared plus one half mv squared becomes mv squared. And so solving for that velocity, I divide both sides by m. And I'm going to take the square root. And I get that the velocity of the center of mass equals the square root of gl sine theta. In part C, now I'm looking for this hoop as it rolls off the table. And it says to derive an expression for the horizontal distance from the edge of the table to where the hoop lands on the floor. And so if I go back and I look at the drawing that was given at the beginning, I have that as it's rolling off the edge of the table, because the table is horizontal, that velocity is only in the x direction. And so it's going to go off the table and it becomes a projectile and it's going to land some distance d in the horizontal direction. And that's what we're trying to solve for. And so to do this, we're going to be looking at the motion in the x and y directions. We're going to be going through and looking at projectile motion. So I'm going to set up a column for my horizontal quantities and my vertical quantities. In the horizontal direction, it's starting at a horizontal position 0. The initial horizontal velocity is the velocity of the center of mass that we calculate in part b the square root of gl sine theta. There's no acceleration in the horizontal direction. And then I'm going to set up my variables for the vertical direction. In the vertical direction, I have that the hoop is starting at a height capital H, that was the height of the table. It's ending at the ground, which is a height zero. The initial vertical velocity is zero because as it left the table, it was moving horizontally only. And the acceleration in the vertical direction is negative g negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And so I'm going to use this to calculate the time from the vertical motion, and then I'm going to use that time with the horizontal motion to find the horizontal distance. To find the time that this takes to reach the ground from the vertical motion, I need to look at my kinematic equation that relates the position and time. And so I know all the quantities in there except for t, and so I can substitute them in and solve for t in terms of the other quantities. So I get my time to reach the ground is the square root of 2h over g. And now I'm going to use the same kinematic equation with the horizontal direction to find the horizontal distance traveled. Because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, I just get that the horizontal distance equals the horizontal velocity times the time. It's moving with a constant speed in the horizontal direction.
And so to find that distance, I'm going to plug in my horizontal velocity, and I'm going to plug in the time that I just calculated. And I could just leave the expression like that. You're not required to simplify things on the AP test, but I can combine those two square roots. I can combine them into one, and it will simplify it down a little bit into the square root of 2HL sine theta. When I combine the square roots, the g's will cancel out. The final piece says, suppose that the hoop is now replaced by a disc having the same mass and radius. How will the distance from the edge of the table to where the disc lands on the floor compare with the distance determined in part C for the hoop? We saw that the distance that the hoop traveled depended on that velocity of the center of mass. And so to be able to answer this, we need to understand how the velocity of the center of mass is going to be different for the hoop or the disc. If I look at the hoop, the hoop has all of the mass a distance r away. And so the rotational inertia was capital M r squared. But the disc has the mass spread all throughout the entire disc. And so the rotational inertia of the disc is going to be smaller. Again, the rotational inertia depends on the mass and how far that mass is from the center of mass. And so the hoop has all of the mass a distance r away, but the disc has only some of the mass a full distance r away, and a lot of it, most of it, is actually in closer. And so the rotational inertia is going to be smaller. And so you don't need to know the exact expression for that rotational inertia to be able to answer this question. You can understand it conceptually. But you could, if you knew the two rotational inertias, you could use that as the justification. The rotational inertia of a hoop is mr squared, and the rotational inertia of a disk about its center is 1 half mr squared. And again, that rotational inertia is smaller because you have a lot more mass that's closer to the axis of rotation. It has less rotational inertia. And so to understand which one is going faster, we need to recognize that we have the same potential energy turning into the same amount of total kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp. But for the disk, because the rotational inertia is smaller, there's a smaller fraction of the total kinetic energy in the rotational piece, which makes this linear piece larger. So the velocity of the center of mass for the disk is going to be bigger. For the hoop, the rotational inertia was larger. And so that meant that there's going to be more rotational kinetic energy, which means that there's less translational kinetic energy. For the hoop, the velocity of the center of mass is smaller. So because the disk has the larger velocity for the center of mass, because it's going to take the exact same time to reach the ground, that had nothing to do with the velocity. Because the initial vertical velocity was zero, the time is going to still be exactly the same. But in that same time, because it's traveling faster, the disk is going to travel farther. So the distance from the edge of the table to where the disk lands on the floor is going to be greater than the distance determined in part C. And the full explanation, you would need to describe that the rotational inertia of the disk is smaller, which means that there's going to be less rotational kinetic energy, which also means that there must be more translational kinetic energy. So if the rotational kinetic energy goes down, the translational kinetic energy must go up because we still have all of the potential energy getting transformed into the total kinetic energy. And then we also had to understand that the velocity of the center of mass was what we used to get that horizontal distance. And so the bigger that velocity of the center of mass is, the farther it's going to travel by the time it reaches the ground. Again, this is an extremely good problem to look at for review because it involves conservation of energy, it involves kinematics, it involves Newton's laws, it involves rotational motion and torque. And so it has a lot of different pieces in it and it makes you put all of those pieces together. Again, that's the biggest thing that you need to practice as you're looking at these problems, is how to take all of the different parts of the problem and break them down into their fundamental pieces. And that's something that just comes with practice and practice and practice.